Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening episode of Pursue. This is Pursue 14G, which is hematology, general and fundamental. We are streaming live from GMC S Chandigarh via Kolkata. We have a very important person on a very very pertinent topic. The topic of the day is structure of the marrow and the hemopoietic microenvironment, which is the basic fundamental of hematology. And to talk on that, we have Dr. Anita Tehlan. She is an MD, DNB, MAMS, and a DM in hematopathology from PGI Chandigarh. Presently, she is a professor in the Department of Pathology at the Government Medical College and Hospital Chandigarh. She was awarded the Professor R. N. R. Nath Gold Medal for Best Published Research in 2000 at PGI Chandigarh. She is a reviewer and referee of various specialty journals with multiple publications in national and international journals and book chapters. Before I ask Dr. Thailand to start, let me request all of you to please keep your mic muted, your camera off, and please don't share your screen. With this, let me request ma'am, ma'am, please share your screen and let's start. Uh, is it uh, visible and am I audible, Dr. Nadi? Yeah, just press that hide, ma'am. Yes. You're perfectly fine. Please start. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadeen, for giving me this opportunity. Today, I'm here to talk about the structure of bone marrow. Over the years, various uh, new uh, modalities have developed. And initially, bone marrow used to be very painful. But now, with uh, recent advances, the procedure has become better and more comfortable for the patient. Therefore, it is absolutely pertinent for us that we should be able to glean as much information as we can from this invasive procedure. I shall be talking about both the bone as well as the bone marrow. Bone marrow is the soft viscous tissue which occupies within the bony cavity and it is composed of a heterogeneous population of cells which are either directly or indirectly involved in the primary function of hematopoiesis. It is implicated in almost all the diseases and it is also one of the favored sites for metastasis and uh, let's see how it influences our aging. So bone marrow improvements have also uh, made us see the bone marrow more carefully. However, it is difficult to analyze the bone marrow because it is enclosed within the bone and therefore it is not available for imaging studies. And the majority of the studies which are done are done on mouse marrows. <coughs> So marrow is one of the largest organs and constitutes around 4 to 5 percent of our whole body weight and its main function is that it produces the hematopoietic cells which produce uh, which are supported by the stromal cells and then these cells they mature and they are released into the peripheral blood where they perform various functions and the daily workload of bone marrow is around 2.5 billion red cells, 2.5 billion platelets, 1 billion granulocytes per kg body weight and it has to keep adjusting from the neonate or intrauterine life to a 70 or 80 years old male. So all this time various adjustments need to be made. Hematopoiesis occurs in the cavities of certain bones that contain hematopoietically active red marrow and whole of our skeleton does not have this active red marrow and uh, initially the bone formation is predominantly endochondral ossification which occurs in the long bones. So the 
<coughs> cortex of the bone is lined by the periosteum which are lined by the periosteal cells so this cortical bone is very thick and en encompasses the bone marrow then this cortical bone then gives a honeycombing of these bony trabeculae which are lined by the endosteal cells and they run parallel and in between they have the cement lines where they get uh, mineralized and ossified so you have the periosteum which gives the strength and the shape and then you have this predominantly uh, parallel trabeculae thin trabeculae so an asthmatic network of thin trabeculae is there and in between this anastomotic network there lies the semi uh, solid viscous bone marrow now the bone marrow is not uniformly present in the medullary space there are these clusters of stem cells and their progenies which lie as irregular cords although they may be appearing irregular cords to us at present around the sinusoids however they are absolutely spatially arranged and they have a specific purpose why they are present in that location specifically and not some other location so the spatial arrangement of the bone marrow is also contributing to its function various uh, there is a constant uh, modeling of the bones and there is significant structural and functional heterogeneity in our skeleton therefore Uh, the bone needs to keep interacting both with abnormal and normal cells so what are the cells which are uh, necessary for doing this we have the osteoclasts which are responsible for the reabsorption of the bone we have the stem cell and the osteoblast which form the bone matrix osteocytes are present where they maintain the bony tissue so starting with osteoblasts the osteoblasts their main function is formation of bone regulation of bone resorption and regulation of the hemopoietic environment they do this function with the help of various growth factors like mgc gsf c gsf gm csf il1 il6 and they also produce various cytokines like tgf osteopontin and cxl12 i shall be talking more about this and their role a little later the other cells we have is the osteoclastic cells osteoclastic cells are the multinucleated giant cells whose main function is to reabsorb the bone by reabsorbing the bone they regulate the osteoblastic activity and they also control the entry and exit of the stem cells from the marrow they communicate with the osteoblasts via a rank system which we shall talk later so this rank rankle and opg system of signaling is the one which helps the osteoblast and osteoclast to interact so therefore the bone remodeling is continuous well regulated and uh, there is significant structural and functional heterogeneity in the sense that in adult marrow only the flat bones will have the red marrow the rest of it will be uh, not there whereas in a neonate the active marrow is present at almost all places now this bone remodeling is basically done at basic uh, multicellular units so what are these basic multicellular units their main job is to remove the mineralized bone which is done by the osteoclasts <coughs> bone formation is done by the osteoblasts which is followed by the mineralization so both bone and the bone marrow they function together in this regulation now where do these uh, bmus reside so these bmus they are done this work of bmu is done in what is called a bone remodeling compartment 
so what happens is that the there is a canopy which is formed such as here so in this canopy the lining cells osteoblasts which are there they will be persistent and these cells will get detached forming a space and the osteoclast will reabsorb bone forming more space and osteoblast will come and uh, form the new bone and then it will get mineralized so we have the bone remodeling compartment where this bone uh, basic multicellular units they do their function in the bone remodeling compartment so uh, at a given time all these processes go on maybe at different sites in the bone marrow usually the initial event is the reabsorption however formation and reabsorption the cycles keep going on there are uh, how the bone uh, is influenced by various pathological states is well evident by the bony changes seen in severe anemias like but beta thalassemia major or sickle cell anemia where the bone has got modified and it shows hair on end appearance there is whitening of the uh, facial bones and in sickle cell h shaped vertebral end uh, bodies are seen so these prove that whenever something is happening in the marrow it also influences the bone itself other examples are the systemic mastocytosis and gaucher's disease the main supply of the bone marrow is by the nutrient artery which is the main supplier a less uh, important supplier is the periosteal artery this nutrient artery gets divided into ascending descending and radial branches these radial branches go and pierce the cortex and then the blood from this and as well as the periosteal arteries mixes and small capillaries are formed here and these capillaries join to form sinuses which then convert to venous sinuses and then these venous sinuses combine to form central sinuses and the blood goes back through the emissionary vein so these sinusoids this heavy sinusoidal formation appears as if this is a very very vascular organ which it is however the central part of the bone marrow shows a little less concentration of uh, oxygen and maybe hypoxic also what about innervations so piercing the bone and then going into the bone marrow to innervate is is done by both myelinated and non myelinated fibers but it is not done very frequently so these small twigs both myelinated and unmyelinated non myelinated they elaborate various hormones neurohumors which will affect the hematopoiesis then there is a concept of neuroreticular complex this neuroreticular complex says that uh, there is a functional regulatory unit which is basically made of nerve terminals which are adjacent to the periarteriolar adventitial cells now periarterial adventitial cells themselves they make a syncytium so once they make a syncytium even if there are small nerve fibers it gets amplified and the job is done so this was in brief about the bone is vascular and its neural uh, components now uh, the other two main components in the bone marrow are the hematopoietic system and the uh supporting stromal tissue when we talk morphologically uh, about bone marrow we talk about uh, these couple of termina <coughs> couple of terminologies <coughs> i'm sorry which are the bony trabeculae and the area around the bony trabecula is called a paratrabecular region and then we have a lot of sinusoids that is called sinusoidal and in between we have the interstitial area so when we are describing morphologically 
we talk in terms of paratrabecular, sinusoidal or interstitial localization of the cells, the stroma or any other tissue that we are talking of. <coughs> so hematopoiesis occurs in the extravascular space between marrow sinuses and the cellularity is obviously more in a three year old child, the, all the marrow is cellular. Whereas with advancing age, almost 10% cellularity decreases with uh, every decade. And uh, in 70 years old male, we will have only few uh, spaces where we can see the active marrow, rest would be fat. Now these hematopoietic cells are not arranged in ra random. But as I said earlier, they have consistent spatial uh, relationships and uh, <clears throat> the main hematopoiesis occurs when uh, this is the, let's suppose, an, an endothelial cell. This is the luminal side and this is the abluminal side. The uh, luminal side, uh, the abluminal side has a coat of adventitial reticular cells. The syncytial cells of neuroreticular complex that I talked about is also here, which is formed. So these hematopoietic cells, they migrate into the extravascular space on the abluminal side and they proliferate and differentiate under the influence of the non-hematopoietic cells, which are the stromal cells and the extracellular membrane. They help in direct its proliferation and differentiation. So what is the spatial organization that I have been talking about? So erythroid series are located in the center intratrabecular region as well as the megakaryocytic series whereas the myeloid series are located in the endosteal region. So what do we want from our erythroid series? We want that uh, they should produce almost million cells so that they meet our requirements and uh, this makes the erythropoiesis a very complex and highly regulated process and uh, these uh, precursor cells they undergo various series of structural and biochemical changes under the effect of cytokines and transcription factors like erythropoietin, GATA, EKLF and SL and we also want that whenever there is a need this biological, uh, this uh, process should get accelerated and it does get accelerated and uh, our levels are maintained in a normal physiological range. So morphologically, as I said, that they are present in the intratrabecular region or the interstitial region and they can be identified on a HE section by these darkly staining which are called the ink dot nuclei kind of cells and uh, they so on a higher part when you look at these cells they have a central macrophage and their cells are surrounding it so uh, as we've learned the erythropoiesis earlier we know that uh, we have a pro erythroblast which is a large cell then we have intermediate and late erythroblast which later gives rise to a anucleated RBC now this central macrophage pearl stain will demonstrate that it also has iron and these are the various uh, stages of maturation of erythroid cells. On MGG these cells they look uh, dark blue. You can identify the macrophage, some uh, debris is there in the macrophage and the various erythroid cells are surrounding the macrophage. So this is called an erythroblastic island, which is the basic characteristic unit for a hematopoiesis. Now, what does this macrophage do? It can be similar to uh, old lady sitting in between and feeding the kids around. And when she is feeding them, she is also trying to give them stories or the kids are enjoying themselves around a central table. So if we uh, extend the same thing, then around a central macrophage, these erythroid cells are sitting. 
So let's see what are these erythroid cells. So around the macrophage, the early erythroblast is on the uh, sitting on the macrophage. As it matures, it needs to extrude its nucleus. So the macrophage eats its nucleus, and then the reticulocyte gets detached from the macrophage and goes away. So that means the erythroblast is giving anchor and forming an island for these uh, cells. It is also providing various proliferation and differentiation interactions. So what are these interactions? We know that we have various adhesion molecules which are there which interact and it also phagocytoses the extruded nuclei and obviously we know about the uh, transfer of iron when it is attached to the progen uh, macrophage. So in a healthy state, the erythroblastic island will provide iron that will also promote erythropoiesis and enucleation by these membrane interactions and will eat up the phagocytose nuclei. What happens in stress and disease? In stress and disease also, uh, for example, whenever there is stress, the splenic macrophages will engulf these RBCs and produce anemia. And depending on the disease, the macrophage may be depleted or may be increased. So just to say that this erythroblastic island will respond to the disease process. So what are we supposed to look for in the erythroid series? We have to look at the proportion of erythroid cells. We have to look at the various uh, relative proportion of these cells. We have to look at these erythroblastic islands, where they are present, how do they appear, where are they located, and obviously the morphology of erythroblast and its erythropoiesis if it is there. Coming to the next series is the megakaryocytic series. Megakaryocytes are fairly rare. I would say rare because they are almost 1 in 10,000 cells which is a megakaryocyte. It is a large cell and produces uh, platelets by fragmentation and uh, <coughs> the production may increase even 10 to 20 times and we use various thrombomimetic drugs which increase its production. So the erythro um, megakaryoblast is a small cell but the megakaryocyte that we are talking about is the largest cell in marrow which is around 5200 mic micrometer and it has got these long pseudopods which ultimately proplatelets or platelet formation is there. This occurs because of endo reduplication which occurs in these. So where do these megakaryocytes sit? So they sit in the intra trabecular region but where in the intra trabecular region? they sit in the abluminal side of the sinusoids. So uh, there are some hematopoietic cells, we will talk about this a little later. So they, uh, on the abluminal side of the sinusoids, say the proliferate become larger and uh, they sit on these uh, adjacent to the sinusoid, sorry, adjacent to the sinusoid. When they are sitting here, they give uh, pseudopods, uh, they give these uh, platelet clumps, platelets which are discharged into the sinusoid. It's just like a long uh, extending your hand and uh, giving out something from your fingertips where uh, these platelets are discharged in the sinusoids. Another purpose these megakaryocytes sit, uh, do is that some cells which are traveling for example, a neutrophil wants to get released into the system. So it can go through the megakaryocyte and get released into the circulatory system directly. This we have been calling as imperilopoiesis. So this is how it looks like in a profound biopsy where these uh, big megakaryocytes are uh, abutting the sinusoids either in the perisinusoidal or in the intrasinusoidal uh, places. PA stain can be used to highlight this. So what are we supposed to look for megakaryocytic series morphologically? 
their number, their morphology, their localization, and their clustering effect. What about myeloid series? The myeloid series is located at the paratrabecular region or the endosteal region. So this is the paratrabecular region where the myeloid precursors are located. And uh, when these precursors mature, they go towards the intratrabecular region where in the interstitium you have the maturing myeloid series. So immature myeloid series would be in the paratrabecular region and mature myeloid series would be in the interstitial region. If the immature myeloid series comes in the interstitial region, it is called abnormal localization of immature myeloid precursors. And ALIP can be called positive if you have more than three aggregates of uh, more than five myeloid precursors or three to five myeloid precursors. So uh, CD34 has been put to identify these myeloid precursors. And ALIP is a marker of uh, dysplasia and can be seen in MPS. So for myeloid series, we are supposed to look at the proportion of granulocytic series, their relative proportion, morphology, and ALIP if it is there or any other signs of dysphoesis. Lymphoid cells are not so many in the marrow. The mature lymphocytes are seen in interstitially distributed and they are usually scanned. However, sometimes they can form aggregates and uh, reactive lymphoid aggregates uh, almost never have a paratrabecular location. So if you find a reactive lymphoid aggregate in the paratrabecular location, it should raise a possibility of a neoplastic population. What about plasma cells? Plasma cells are normally located uh, in the perivascular region where uh, they can be highlighted by CD138. So uh, they are usually scattered and located in the perivascular region. So plasma cells are located in the perivascular region. CD138 positivity can highlight these cells. So, uh, in addition to uh, the hematopoietic cells, bone marrow environment, microenvironment is composed of these supporting cells, which includes the vascular sinuses, the extracellular matrix, the stromal elements, and these are the cells which provide a structural scaffolding where uh, the cells reside. So this is one cross-sectional diagram where we have the nutritive vessel, the cortex, the nerves, and the reticular cells, sinusoids, and the parenchyma. So the stroma will consist of the vessels, the reticulin and fibroblasts, which will form a reticular network, and adipose tissue. So I will discuss these in some detail. Majority of them are supposed to arise from this uh, uh, skeletal stem cell which is located on the bone marrow sinusoids and there is significant transdermal plasticity in the sense that these uh, cells can be formed whenever uh, they are required. So what are these cells? So uh, the various cells which are included in bone marrow stromal cells are the adipocytes which are in the central core and uh, yellow marrow. They indirectly and directly uh, also influence the hematopoiesis. Endothelial cells can be seen in the sinusoidal lining or in the arteriolar lining. And these are the entry to the bone marrow and therefore they enable the exchange of various molecules between blood and marrow. Fibroblasts, they synthesize the reticular network and the collagen at times. Osteoblasts are usually present on the cortical region and they synthesize bone tissues and regulate the bone angiogenesis. And uh, osteoclasts and chondrocytes. They In addition, the stromal cells also uh, nourish the hematopoietic cells. They give various nerve growth factors like PCAM, tensin, endoglin, collagens. They express IL-6 receptors, IL-1, insulin-like growth factors and various chemokines. And they also express TGF-beta-secret, which is a negative regulator of hematopoiesis. 
so stromal cells may promote as well as negatively regulate the hematopoiesis the sinus uh, which is there uh, it is uh, the luminal side is lined by the endothelial cells and then there is a basement lamina and then these cells uh, and the abluminal side the adventitial reticular cells combine to form a meshwork so that is how the sinus is organized and this is the main barrier and this is where all the interchange occurs it is actively endocytic and it expresses vwf collagen lemon and various adhesion molecules so because it is one of the main barriers therefore it is capable of regulating the cellular traffic adventitial reticular cells which are on the abluminal side they synthesize the reticular fibers their cytoplasmic processes they form a meshwork <clears throat> and they constitute the reticulum of the marrow and they express uh, cd10 13 and class 1 antigens in disease states we have seen especially in myofibrosis the vascular uh, architecture gets disturbed and you can see dilated sinus fat is an integral part of the bone marrow microenvironment and the bone marrow fat results from an accumulation of fat cells within the marrow and as the age increases the number of uh, amount of fat increases these adipocytes which are there they contain a big lipid vacuole of triglycerides which is made up of fatty acids which can be saturated mono or polyunsaturated so initially these uh, adipocytes were only thought to be filler cells which were uh, uh, which just filled the void which was left by the hematopoietic cells but uh, now as our understanding is increasing we know that they have definite roles so they are the major sources of energy and they are also modulators of the adjacent tissue by secreting paracrine and autocrine factors so uh, the bone marrow adipocytes they can provide local energy they can also influence the osteoclast and uh, influence the osteoblast they secrete adipokines and leptins and influence the mesenchymal differentiation cells and they are also implicated in malignant cells so this uh, we have seen earlier that whenever we give steroids there is osteonecrosis especially of the femoral neck so when these adipocytes they undergo ischemic they might lead to osteonecrosis so is it the same fat that we have at uh, other places like subcutaneous tissue and visceral tissue or is it something else probably it is something else because this is not uh, uh, localized in lobules but it is scattered it is much smaller in size it develops from the mesenchymal stem cells in addition to storage cells it also ex, uh, acts as a secretory cell with leptin and adiponectin and it doesn't undergo lipolysis it promotes hepatogenesis genesis and osteogenesis it expresses uh, rank which promotes leucocytoclastic uh, leuco osteoclastic differentiation and overall it has an important role in microenvironment which is being studied what about extracellular matrix the mesenchymal cells they form a stroma and they are actively laying down extracellular matrix and uh, proteoglycans fibronectin tenexins they are all a group of macromolecules which are distributed on the surface of adventitial cells they help in uh, cell cell interaction cytokine presentation cell differentiation and various interactions like collagen lemon and thrombospontin micro they all help in interactions now coming to the main cell which is the hematopoietic stem cell so what do we want from this hematopoietic stem cell we want that it should produce what we want and it should stay quiet when we don't want it so in some uh, words we want it to be multipotent so that it can give rise to multiple cell types it needs to keep uh, itself uh, for a long time of span so it should be uh, have long term renewals 
and we have the niche where it should be dependent and we should be able to uh, maintain the cell in an undifferentiated state in the niche once it leaves the niche then it gets differentiated differentiated but in the niche it remains undifferentiated and it should also have a property of long term repopulation so what we want is that long term it should be capable of self renewal short term it can go out produce various kinds of cells and then depending on our needs can do that when we were residents we were uh, taught this that uh, the <coughs> hematopoiesis uh, there's a hematopoietic cell which gets divided into a common lymphoid and a common myeloid progenitor and then this myeloid progenitor gives rise to megakaryocytic erythroid and granulocytic progenitors so there has been some uh, advancements in this and a refined model of hematopoiesis is suggested now where it is thought that uh, instead of this three tier mechanism probably uh, the hematopoietic cells are many and they directly get differentiated into various cells and uh, megakaryocyte get differentiated much early so this is called the evolving hematopoiesis concept which says that there is some revision in the classical hierarchy as several new cells are identified and instead of the three tier there is a continuous differentiation which is occurring and probably the megakaryocyte lineage segregates early and uh, this uh, heterogeneity probably reshapes the balanced differentiation tree map so instead of this discrete differentiation probably there is a continuous differentiation landscape which is a more favored now now these hematopoietic cells they need to uh, be preserved in their niches the concept of niche was first proposed by shafield in 1978 who said that there is a physical existence of niche in the bone marrow and uh, there are a variety of cells which make that niche and which maintain that niche as i said earlier it is difficult to image the bone marrow because it is located in a cortical bone and therefore inaccessible for imaging but the newer tests have somehow added to our better understanding so what are our requirements from the niche is that we wanted to tightly regulate the number of stem cells and uh, the constituents of the niche should be able to stimulate or inhibit the stem cell number and function and physical interaction which occurs between these different type of cells which ultimately maintains the uh, stem cell in its state so these are together called smart properties which are self renewal maturation apoptosis resting and trafficking so these smart properties are the ones which are required so in a nutshell niche will have a cellular microenvironment and a non cellular microenvironment the cellular microenvironment will have hematopoietic cells and the non hematopoietic cells and uh, the non cellular microenvironment will have the extra cellular matrix which we have discussed non hematopoietic cells the predominant cells are the endothelial cells the fibroblasts and the cells involved in bone hemostasis like osteoblast osteoclast and in apart from the uh, various series the various immune cells the bone derived uh, circulating endothelial precursors and progenitors are also included here so where are the niches that we are talking about as i said earlier the osteoblast they contribute to hematopoietic stem cells so they can be one candidate other can be the endothelial cells because they are the barriers between a developing cell and blood so therefore these initial sites of uh, entrance are controlled by endothelial cells so they are very important and third is the perivascular side so osteoblasts endothelial cells and perivascular sites are the niches so um, these are well recognized uh, uh, sites of uh, stem cells now which is the sinusoidal megakaryocytic niche and the arteriole parasite
but as we study these uh, so this is the domicile of the hemopoietic stem cell both in benign as well as malignant conditions so uh, when we studied their markers so then it was found out that different niches have different markers sinusoidal niches had more uh, cx cl12 whereas uh, arteriolar niches had uh, pea cells which i had described in neuroreticular complex and similarly for these cells so it just goes on to say that somehow all these niches that we talk about are different from each other a little bit so the osteoblastic uh, niches the reticular niches and the perivascular niches so all these niches they have uh, one cell uh, so which are the cells which constitute probably uh, cxcl12 positive cell because it's seen in osteoblastic reticular and the perivascular niche in addition to these uh, cxcl12 positive cells we have nestin positive cells we have leb r positive cells and we also have schwann cells so out of all these cells cxcl12 positive reticular cells are the one which are more frequent and uh, they are the one which are uh, so cxcl12 represents the homeostatic uh, mechanism a chemokine and it is produced by various cells in bone marrow and therefore it is implicated in maintenance of the hemopoietic cells retention of the hemopoietic cells in its niche and also maintaining in inhibiting the uh, hematopoietic cell from going into the cycle so therefore keeping it quiet there are other niches also which are well studied so <coughs> are all these niches same or is there a hierarchical differentiation or is there a hierarchical niche which is first which is second and are they specific so uh, this uh, hemopoietic retention in the bone marrow and mobilization mobilization to the circulation is regulated by a joint action of chemokine hormone neurotransmitter and osteoclastic osteoblastic interaction so it's very dynamic and probably these niches they have different roles but it is not very clear at present what about its uh, neuromodulation so the immune cells uh, in a steady state the cxcl12 and cxc4 they anchor and keep the hemopoietic cell in its niche but whenever there is an external factor which can be in the form of gcsf these uh, cxcr4 uh, they get increased on the hematopoietic cell the <coughs> rank gets inhibited and these cells they get mobilized and go into the blood vessel so that means to say that these cells can be influenced by many immune and hematopoietic systems and this is one gcsf is one molecule which has been uh, commercially and therapeutically utilized for the mobilization of stem cells bone marrow microenvironment is affected in both infection inflammation benign as well as malignant conditions and uh, the dysfunction of the interaction between hematopoietic system and the progenitor cells they lead to different uh, disease states so what happens in infection is that we see emergency myelopoiesis in the form of increase in left there is mobilization of mature myeloid cells these uh, cells go into the circulation as can be uh, evidenced by the shift to left and there is hematopoietic injury by the various cytokines which are released in infection the infection also remodels and damages the microenvironment <clears throat> so uh, whenever there is chronic inflammation in the bone marrow microenvironment it can lead to initiator or even driver of a hematological malignancy 
so all these uh, circulatory cytokines are increased in an inflammatory microenvironment like il6 and uh, these in turn affect the megakeratocytes to produce more megakeratocytes they uh, these yellow uh, ones are the inflammatory microenvironments they affect the erythroid island which leads to its differentiation defect in addition they also affect all these uh, cells which are leopard positive nestin positive cells all these cells get affected and the hematopoietic support gets decreased and these lead to myeloid expansion and recruitment of innate immune cells this also leads to impaired self renewal and uh, oxy output genotoxic stress which may give rise to a malignant clone so there is a possibility of malignant clone whenever we have chronic inflammation and all this leads to increased reactive oxygen species which adds further to its insult so these can lead to malignancies so in a controlled state the cxcl12 cell has a hematopoietic cell which is nicely sitting in its niche but when it progresses to uh myelodysplasia kind of thing these cells increase so do the leukemic cells they increase and however in mds they are still controlled and uh, although they are present at uh, locations where they should not be but they are still uh, being held to the cxcl12 whereas by the time it turns into malignancy the leukemic blast have decreased the cxcl12 and uh, they have uh, reprogrammed the cell and all these cells have increased and are ready to leave the bone marrow so in a leukemic bone marrow although it's highly complex but various uh, mechanisms are involved in initiation various signaling pathways like beta catenin jack 1 ptpn11 and icer1 they are all involved which leads to proliferation of these cells when from initiation when it goes on to expansion and chemo resistance states it uh, co-opts the mechanisms of the normal hematopoietic cells so a normal hematopoietic cell uh, utilizes cxcl12 and all so it um, utilizes them for its expansion and preservation after this it remodels the hematopoietic niche by blocking and causing differential uh, alterations decreases the healthy hematopoiesis and is ready to leave the cell so a leukemic cell initiates expands and remodels the whole bone marrow microenvironment system to its favor and later becomes independent of these bone marrow signals this also leads uh, to the resistance mechanism which is probably mediated by these cells in mds the increased apoptosis is possibly the most important mechanism which is dependent on the close uh, cellular contact whereas in mpn the cells they become less supportive of normal hematopoiesis because of uh, various inflammatory like cytokines pre fibrotic factors are secreted so the main players here are different which are the mesenchymal stromal cells and all this probably leads to uh, more fibrosis and uh, more extracellular matrix which gets deposited in uh, myeloproliferative disease what about lymphoid disease so the stromal cells uh, lymphoma cells also learns to interact with the stromal cells uh, and both the bone marrow derived mesenchymal stromal cells to its advantage and transforms the bone marrow microenvironment in its favor what about myeloma myeloma is unique in the sense that it is an intramedullary uh, lesion so this intramedullary uh, cell will affect 
almost all the cells which are surrounding it, whether it's the stem, mesenchymal stem cells, the endothelial cells, the fat cells, the immune cells, and the osteoclastic cells. One of the main key mechanisms is that uh, the myeloma cells, they uh, reabsorb these cells, which is probably by IL-6. Uh, they increase the reabsorption, secretion and reabsorption of these cells. And uh, the characteristically immune suppression and lytic bone lesions are probably caused by the TNF family, which are the rank, rank ligand and osteoprotein. So this is the rank, rank ligand, osteoprotein signaling that I had initially talked about. Now this uh, balance between bone formation and osteoclastic bone resorption is disturbed in favor of net bone resorption through increased osteoclastic activity and decreased osteoplastic activity. What about uh, aplastic anemia? The whole marrow microenvironment gets disturbed in aplastic anemia. Uh, the defect is in supporting hematopoiesis there is a problem in formation of these colony formic units and uh, there is impairment in physical physiological maturation and self cell surface receptor expression so on electron microscopy this is a normal cell where we can see uh, the cells with its stroma and here there is a scanty degenerative marrow with little intervening stroma and there are frequent apoptotic holes so apoptosis is there now uh, bone a lot of tumors tend to metastasize to bone marrow and it seems to be the favorite site of uh, many tumors to metastasize when these tumors metastasize to bone they upstage their grading so why is bone marrow the favored site for metastasis so there is a crosstalk between bone metastatic cancer cells and bone marrow environment so all these cells which are blood forming and bone forming, they somehow support these cancer cells for metastasis. So uh, the theory that has been uh, suggested is seed and soil theory. So the bone marrow microenvironment describes, uh, gives the soil and the metastatic cell is the seed. So this seed gets a fertile soil and therefore it metastasizes. So uh, the various cells like osteoblasts, they help in early dissemination and colonization. They regulate the dormancy osteocytes. They promote the osteolytic damage and migratory ability of metastatic cells. Osteoclasts will uh, reabsorb bone and, uh, uh, and therefore create space for these cancer cells because bone marrow is a crowded place where we have so many cells. Immune cells will immune suppress and directly influence the bone remodeling. Adipocytes, they behave like uh, they do in the normal hematopoiesis. Endothelial cells will regulate the dormancy, chemoresistance and outgrowth of metastatic cells. So all these cells combined, they provide a favorable environment for metastasis to these cells. What about aging? So our uh, hematopoietic cells have divided n number of times and have kept trust for a long time. But slowly they tend to lose their ability for self-renewal and regeneration with age. So one of the most important manifestations of aging is the depletion of the stem cell function, which gradually declines in ability of the adult tissue specific stem cells to maintain cellular hemostasis of the tissues in which they reside. So when these uh, cells are dividing, they tend to accumulate somatic mutations. And initially they are polyclonal hematopoiesis, which is there in young age. But gradually this uh, polyclonal hematopoiesis give rise to an oligoclonal one. And at some point, these oligoclonal hematopoiesis may even become clonal hematopoiesis. This may be one of the reasons why uh, certain malignancies are more in the older age. However, clonal hematopoiesis is not equivalent to an overt pathology. Therefore, just the presence of clonal hematopoiesis should not be considered as an overt pathology. So clonal hematopoiesis can occur in 
progressive aging. So to summarize, bone and bone marrow are, is a unique system with relevant spatial organizations. There are morphological changes which are identifiable and uh, which are uh, correlated with disease and uh, normal states. Hematopoietic cells are unique in the sense that they respond to all our needs, they keep us going for a long time and uh, the mesenchymal stroma cells, they keep supporting this microenvironment. The hematopoietic cells, they reside in these special niches and these niches are composed of a heterogeneous cell population, um, composed of uh, oste osteoblasts, osteoclasts, adipocytes, fibroblasts, mesenchymal stromal cells, endothelial cells and all these. And they are well regulated by the effect of growth factors, extracellular matrix molecules. So this crosstalk between the hematopoietic cell and the niche where it is staying is absolutely essential for its survival, self renewal, migration, quiescence, and differentiation. The newer techniques, uh, whether it's endogenous ablation of a specific cell type or advanced imaging techniques, single cell mass cytometry, they are adding to our knowledge of this uh, bone marrow microenvironment understanding. And uh, various drugs, for example, in multiple myeloma, Bortezomib and linalinamide are used successfully and they target the bone marrow microenvironment. So bone marrow microenvironment is uh, the topic of current research and targeted therapies. Uh, and maybe in near future, we shall learn a little more. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely right. Bone marrow microenvironment is the area of interest for all the biologists. Thank you so much, Dr. Anita, for a wonderful talk. Very basic, but very essential for us to understand the subject in its detail. And Actually, it's a very vast topic. I, I, th you. I thought I should concise it into yeah. a way so that we can understand. At least I can yeah. understand. <laughs> I can also understand. <laughs> yeah. Just then it's hold on. well it's done. <laughs> sure. No, it has been well done. Very well, very nicely presented. Excellent. Very nicely compiled. The whole talk was so nice, so relevant, and very, very pertinent. Uh, there are there are no questions on the YouTube. I would request you to share the PDF so that we can upload okay, it on the I'll do that. Meet. Yes, right. yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so, so much. much. Thank you so much. Okay, bye bye. Thank you so Take much. Take care. Bye bye. bye. Good night. Bye. Take care. Bye. Good night. Bye.